Everyone, welcome to another episode of Digital Health Entrepreneurship. Today's episode is special because we have uh, one of Fruit Street Health's advisors on the show, um, but also somebody who is doing a whole lot more than just advising Fruit Street Health for the health community. So we have Dr. David Katz on the show. And Lawrence, I want to pass it to you to kind of get this conversation with Dr. David Katz started. Yeah, sure. Um, I would consider Dr. Katz one of my idols alongside Dean Ornish that uh, inspired me to pursue a career in lifestyle medicine. He was a guest lecturer at one of my uh, Harvard Extension School classes, which he probably doesn't remember because he talks all over the world. But um, uh, yeah, so I mean, Dr. Katz, could you just introduce yourself for people that uh, might not be familiar? Well, first of all, Lawrence, thank you. I appreciate knowing I had that influence on all the impressive things you're doing now. It's a pleasure to join you. And of course, you know, the first credential I'll queue up is I'm, I'm proud to be a science advisor to Fruit Street, the work on diabetes prevention, and I think all of the other additional opportunities you're creating through a, an expanded platform addressing the COVID pandemic and, and lots of other opportunities after that. So proud of all that, uh, proud of the relationship and, and really delighted that I had a, a favorable influence on you and, and glad to be in the company of my good friend, Dean Ornish. Uh, so I'm, you know, a physician uh, who has spent most of my career as, as sort of the, the typical academic clinician triathlete. And, and what that means, if you're a physician and you're working in academia, and I was at Yale for the better part of 30 years in, in one role or another, you're doing teaching, research, and patient care. And, and that, that occupied my career. I taught many courses at Yale for many years, saw patients, uh, trained in internal medicine, but I did a subsequent residency in preventive medicine, public health, and that's really been the focus of my career, as you know. And within that space of disease prevention, health promotion, I settled on the influence of lifestyle. And it, and it wasn't an arbitrary choice, Lawrence. I graduated my preventive medicine residency and got my master's in health in 1993, ancient history now, I realize. <laughs> but uh, you know, let, let's say I finished the program in June, that would be the typical time of year, I guess, to wrap. And then in September, so, you know, I was a newly minted preventive medicine specialist. I, I, maybe I had just taken my boards. Maybe I hadn't even yet taken them, and I was just anticipating them with the customary trepidation. But right then, what I consider to be arguably the most seminal publication in the peer-reviewed literature in the span of my career came out in JAMA entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. Pretty provocative title. Uh, two luminaries in public health authored it, uh, Mike McGinnis, who's now at the National Academy of Medicine, and Bill Fagey, who's retired. And essentially what they did is they, they looked at the full expanse of epidemiology, the burdens of chronic disease, and said that the simple reality is the stuff that winds up on death certificates, which, by the way, is written by, you know, guys like me. You know, when we're medical and in the hospital all the time, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, your beeper goes off, somebody seems to have passed, it's your job to pronounce them and fill out the death certificate. So, you know, it's not like we had a deep, intimate knowledge necessarily of this person and all the stuff that went on in their lives. We just, okay, uh, you know, they had a heart attack two days ago, so the cause of death was atherosclerotic disease of the coronary arteries, we're done. What McGinnis and Fagey had the perspicacity to ask was what caused that? That's not really a cause. You know, atherosclerosis is an effect. What's it an effect of? And, and so too with chronic lung disease and, and diabetes. And so what they did in that paper was examine these underlying root causes of all the premature deaths in the United States and frankly, the modern world. And, and when they were done with their analysis, they pretty much explained them all. And what was fascinating is that this list was all modifiable stuff. Some of it required action biotics, exposure to toxins, and regulating highways and all that. But 80% of the adverse effect, 80% of the premature deaths in our country every year were attributable to lifestyle factors. And, and really, they, they were just the first three entries on this list of 10 that they came up with. And they were bad use of feet, in other words, lack of physical activity, bad use of forks, poor dietary patterns, and bad use of fingers, namely to do this bringing cigarettes to your mouth. So I looked at that. Talk to, said, okay. Excuse me, I had no idea where that was going. Bad use of feet? <laughs> what? And then the third one, bad use of fingers? What, what's the, you know. Feet, forks, Sorry, and fingers. It's, it's, yeah, it, bad yeah, it's, bad it's, use it's, of it's feet, fun. forks, and fingers. It's fun, it's memorable, and it's the truth. So yeah, bad, use, bad use of feet, forks, and fingers basically 
accounted for 80% of the premature deaths in our country year after year after year and still does. So anyway, I, I say, okay, I got to dive in there. It doesn't make sense really to focus a career in which on answering the next unaddressed question when the answers we already have are being left to languish and they could eliminate 80% of all chronic disease and premature death. So that, you know, the rest is history as it were. And I focused on nutrition because of the Goldilocks test. I mean, essentially, Tobacco already had a lot of people working on it. And besides, you know, it, it's a hard thing to fix, but it's simple. Not smoking is good. Smoking is bad. Everybody agrees. Physical activity, frankly, also hard to fix, but simple. Exercising is good. Sitting on our backsides all day long, not so much. Diet is the one variable in that list that actually can confuse people. That's at, you know, it's not just whether, but it's how, which diet's best, which variant's best. So I thought, you know, you can really spend a career in this space. So I focused preferentially on nutrition and, and here we are. And, you know, I ran the Prevention Research Center at Yale for 20 years and um, the, 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 basically the, the value prop of my career has been to leverage lifestyle as medicine to add years to lives, add life to years. And the other thing I care about very passionately, Lawrence, is, as you know, and you do too, is the fate of the planet. And, you know, you think about it, most of what medicine does has nothing whatever to do with the fate of the planet. You know, no, no advance in pharmacotherapy is going to help the Amazon or the rainforest in Borneo or save the whales. But shifting dietary patterns at scale in a way that's best for human health actually is best for the planet, too. So, you know, it, it feels good to be able to address that signature issue of our time, the climate, biodiversity, all that important stuff. Healthy people, healthy planet. Yeah, thanks for that background. And uh, as long as we're talking about diet, do you want to just share with everyone um, a little bit about your, your company, Diet ID, as well? Well, you know, I guess that's what qualifies me to join you here on a podcast that's mostly about entrepreneurialism. So, I mean, you know, you, you obviously have relevant credentials there, but uh, though I'm something of a newbie, I, I guess maybe now I do too. So, uh, yeah, I founded and, and run a company. Uh, and I actually left Yale after all these years to do that because I, I believe it's that significant. Essentially, um, there's an expression from business, and, and I would argue it's equally pertinent in medicine. We don't tend to manage what we don't routinely measure. You know, if you don't know what the state of things is, you don't know what's broken, you don't know what to fix, you can't manage that. So in medicine, we tend to measure what matters. I mean, we call those things vital signs, the, the measurements that matter most. And then there's a long list of other things we measure, biomarkers, anthropometrics, biometrics, and on and on it goes. And these days, polyomics. But you know, if it matters, we measure it, we manage it, their treatment goals well. Here we are, you know, almost three decades after the, the, the epiphany of actual causes of death in the United States. Here's what's happened. Fewer people smoke, thank goodness. And so tobacco is no longer the leading cause of premium in the United States. Diet is. Diet is the number one predictor variable in our culture of premature death and chronic disease, period. Uh, and by the way, for people who want a source, I, I really like an op-ed that ran August 26, 2019 in the New York Times, Our Food is Killing Too Many of Us. The authors were Darius Mozafarian, Dean of Nutrition at Tufts, and Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. And actually, what they, so they cite the peer-reviewed literature that makes the case that poor diet kills 500,000 people prematurely in the United States. And by the way, that number is particularly noteworthy as we are constantly fixating on the numbers related to the pandemic. And is, is that per, pardon me, is that per year, 500,000 500,000 people killed prematurely every year. Unreal. Every year, half a million. So, you know, as, as horrible as the COVID pandemic has been, and, you know, we crossed the threshold of 100,000 premature deaths, diet kills five, five times that. I in plain sight does it every year. And by the way, when it's not killing us, it's still hurting us because we have massive type 2 diabetes epidemics in adults and children and hypertension and coronary disease. So a lot of people that diet isn't killing, it's hurting. So, you know, an absolutely massive impact on the population. And yet, we don't manage it effectively, and there's, there are many reasons for that. But one of them is we don't measure dietary intake routinely. It's too cumbersome. Nobody wants to spend 60 to 90 minutes trying to remember everything they ate for the past six months and fill out a food frequency questionnaire. It's equally cumbersome to log everything you eat for the next seven days. That really frustrated me for a long time. 
And, you know, frustration, I guess, is, is the mother of invention because yep. it just kind of percolated in my head. And, you know, one day I was on my elliptical working out and, you know, kind of reflecting on this frustration. Boy, you know, not measuring diet routinely is just rate limiting everywhere. It's rate limiting in medical care. It's rate limiting in research. It's rate limiting in technology. My Apple Watch talks to me about it. I don't know the, I don't know the phrase rate limiting. Could you please explain it? <laughs> Many people like me that probably don't. Well, rate limiting generally refers to, let, let's say you've got an assembly line, you're trying to manufacture something. In this case, what we're trying to produce would be improvements in people's diets. So, you know, all the different things we do to try and improve diets, if you hit some step in that assembly line that's cumbersome, awkward, hard to do, people don't like it, everything slows down there. So rate limiting would be you know, basically in any cascade, it's the step. And we, this comes, you know, comes from technology, but originally comes from biology where we have enzymatic pathways in biochemistry and cell biology, and there's usually a rate limiting enzyme. So it's the step where there's a potential bottleneck. Everything slows down to pass through that spot. So everything in, in research related to nutrition slows down to try and figure out what the heck are people actually eating and how did it change? Everything in clinical care that's trying to address nutrition slows down by trying to understand what exactly is your diet like and how can we improve it? What's a rate limiting step? And it's a rate limiting step, as I was saying, in technology because you know my Apple Watch can talk to me about sleep and stress and physical activity, but since there's no elegant way to know what my diet is to begin with, how can technology help me fix it? Very limited. Anyway, so I was working out one day, reflecting on this, frustrated about it, and all of a sudden I had it. Like origami in reverse. You know, origami takes a flat paper, folds it into a three-dimensional mm -hmm. complex shape. I saw the fully formed three-dimensional complex shape of diet ID and then tried to unfold it in mine and said, but would it work? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought, okay, I think I'm on to something. And, and then I ran it by friends like Walter Willett and Frank Hugh at Harvard to say, uh, it, current and former chair of nutrition at Harvard, say, guys, tell me if, uh, if I'm overlooking something because I, I, I think I had a eureka moment. And, and I did. And we agreed and the rest is history. Uh, my team at Diet Ideas helped me build it out. It's now commercially available. And what we did was completely reinvent dietary assessment and dietary personalization and tracking and, and we reverse engineered it essentially. So all of the tools of dietary assessment involve you trying to remember everything you ate over some period of time or recording it. We skipped over all of that and said, people are really good at pattern recognition. We'll put together the diets, all the different kinds of diets. We'll stratify them by type and quality. We'll turn those into pictures. And then we'll play a game like at the eye doctor where you look at two pictures and your job is simply to say which of the two is clear and which is blurry. And you say, B is clear. And they say, how about now? And you say, A is clear. And they say, how about now? And you say, A is clear again. And they say, how about now? And you say, B. And they say, we're done. We know your prescription in diopters. We do that for diet. So, so there's going to be like diopters. two pictures in front of me and there's like one's Doritos. Which, is Doritos which? clear and one is like an apple? An apple? Yeah, well, no, no, it's, it's a whole diet. <laughs> I didn't mean to be facetious. Not at all. That's exactly how it works. It's just that it's not one food, although, you know, it, it could be. It's a small assembly of foods that directly match to a specific type of diet at a specific quality level. And all of this is at the back end. We have a massive database. But all you need to do is look at two pictures and say, which of these looks more like stuff you eat? And you say, mm, that one. We say, okay, how about now? Two more pictures. Uh, that one. In about 60 seconds, we're done onboarding you. We know your diet type approximately, your diet quality measured objectively, and we can estimate up to 150 nutrient intake levels. And after that, the game is afoot because now we know your starting point. We can help you find the goal diet. We can plot the route from here to there, measure your delta, show it to you in terms of foods, in terms of nutrients, coach you along a path that is uniquely yours. So it's really personalized nutrition because you say, okay, I, I like the Mediterranean diet. Uh, or I want a diet that's ideal for blood pressure, or I want a diet specifically to prevent diabetes mm -hmm. or to manage my diabetes. We help you find that and then help you get there in a sequence of steps. So, you know, again, as you know, Lawrence, I think there are really powerful synergies between Fruit Street and diabetes prevention and what we do at Diet ID. And I look forward to exploring those with you. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like there was a pretty, there had to be a pretty natural fit when you guys cross paths. So I'd love to, if for our listeners to know, like, how did you and Lawrence, how did you guys um, cross paths and realize like, oh, wow, what we're doing goes right together? Well, I, you know, I, I've long had a tremendous interest in the diabetes prevention program and a specific interest 
in making it play in Peoria. You guys, maybe you're all too young to know that expression. Can you make it play in Peoria? Uh, you know, why Peoria, Illinois? I have no idea, but that's the idea. So, you know, it works, but, you know, will it work in a real community? Where, where, will it work where the real folks are? So, you know, the diabetes prevention program was a $174 million randomized clinical trial run by the NIDDK at the NIH. And at the time it was published, and this takes us back to the early aughts, I, I think the, the seminal paper by Nowler et al. came out in 2003, if memory serves. So, you know, I was running the Prevention Center at Yale, and what we did at Prevention Centers was translate knowledge into community practice. We did translational research, so that was our job. Could we take the DPP and make it play in Peoria or New Haven, Connecticut or Bridgeport or, you know, you pick the place, but, you know, can we make it work in the real world? And we're still on that mission. So I've always been fascinated in people who are doing insightful things about that, and Lawrence is among them because he's digitized it with Fruit Street. And Lawrence, I'll turn it over to you to say how we connected because I, you know, I think it was thanks to you rather than me. <laughs> yeah, I think just through uh, that lecture that you gave, perhaps, and well, we've crossed paths several times. But anyway, um, that's an interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about diet as a way to you kind of track healthcare outcomes. Uh, um, and I'm looking forward to integrating that I with another way to track people's um, you know, improvements in the diabetes prevention program. But um, maybe to shift the discussion a little bit to something you and I were talking about the other day. I mean, I you know we're building out Fruit Street into more than a diabetes prevention program, but more of a new model for say virtual primary care that's maybe rooted in lifestyle medicine. Um, and so you have these telemedicine companies like you know, Teladoc, MD Live, Doctor on Demand, which is basically you know, I'm sick and I need a prescription. And then you and I had talked about, well, what if you had maybe a virtual primary care doctor with a care team of like a dietitian, a social worker, a psychologist, and you essentially focused on um, helping people improve their health or their disease status rather than just making it about, you know, calling a doctor to get medication. And you talked about this idea of holistic onboarding. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it was a super exciting conversation. I, I think there's a huge opportunity here. And, and you know, just to be clear, I appreciate the fact that you are you know, directing your talents to telemedicine, but in a unique way. And the, the idea that we have a whole new opportunity to deliver lifestyle as medicine, it's really exciting. So yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, th this notion of holistic onboarding comes from my clinical career originally. I did 10 years more or less of primary care and general medicine, and then I founded an integrative medicine center. And, and I did that because my patients pushed me to. And, and you know, by the way, you do anything bold and innovative and you, you wind up with detractors. So I had my share of detractors saying, you know, this is hocus pocus, this is woo. I wasn't interested in woo. I've written textbooks on evidence-based medicine. I taught biostatistics at Yale for 10 years. I, I was no, not interested in woo. What I was interested in is the fact that we did everything the RCT said and everything that the textbook said, but we didn't manage to make everybody feel better. And when my patients didn't feel better despite me doing all the right stuff, I had a choice. I could either say sorry, run out of my own, or I could say let's get creative together because we're stronger together than you trying to figure this out without me. And then over time, I settled on this model of integrative care where I was working side by side with naturopathic physicians who had different knowledge and different skills, but were equally committed to evidence. And we were able to help a lot of patients that nobody else could help. We did this model of care for 15 years. And in the process of doing that, we wrestled with how, how do you actually do holistic care? You know, somebody's got all kinds of problems. They could be social, they could have chronic pain, they could have trouble sleeping, they're not exercising, maybe they have sleep apnea, their joints hurt. Uh, they're gaining weight, they have low self-esteem, you know, there is no magic wand to wave at that and fix it all. So we developed a model of holistic care that was kind of like reverse engineering the problem. We said, you know, basically people get into these degenerative spirals like circling a drain and the remedy is not a helicopter or a magic wand, it's a staircase where one gets better and then the next thing gets better. And, you know, each thing is an investment in the next opportunity. So if you sleep better, your pain gets better. If your sleep and pain get better, you're more willing to exercise and on and on it goes. So we developed that and we wrote about it. I shared a couple of columns with you that addressed that topic the other day after our conversation. And then it became the final chapter in one of my earlier books, Disease Proof, where I kind of, I mapped out, here's how holistic profiling could work in clinical practice, where you routinely ask 
about a set of factors that affects health almost universally. And you know, it's the, it basically the cardinal elements of lifestyle medicine, feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. And you, you could build it out and add other things, but feet, physical activity, can you do it? Do you do it? Why don't you do it? Forks, dietary pattern, what's yours? Obviously diet ID can answer that. Fingers, do you smoke? Do you drink too much? If so, why? Sleep, are you getting enough? Is it good? Do you feel fresh when you wake? Do you have too much? How do you manage it? And love, social connections. We're social animals. Th th those six components are sort of the cardinal elements of, of lifestyle. And then you could add things like chronic pain, other issues. But holistic onboarding would be to succinctly ask people about all of those. And a digital telemedicine platform with a primary care doc would be ideally suited at starting level to say, okay, which of these stands between you and the vitality you deserve? And what resources available in our ecosystem would most effectively help you address that? And then the primary care provider who is routinely playing the role of gatekeeper kind of oversees the amelioration of that first factor. And then, okay, and what's also, what's the second thing on your list? And we also talked, Lawrence, and I really like this about applying machine learning and artificial intelligence, because at first you're trying to figure out, you know, what is the optimal sequence to go in? You know, which is the thing we fix first? If you can't sleep, you have low self-esteem and you have chronic pain, you know, what, what do we fix first? Well, we can guess, you know, we can guess, or we could ask you, which do you want fixed first? Which is the top priority for you? But better still would be after the first 10,000 people have used the platform, analyze the different sequences and see who got, who, who improved the most, the fastest. We start to get really, really expert at this. And then, you know, the, first of all, we're making use of lifestyle as medicine. We are certainly addressing chronic disease and chronic disease risk factors like diabetes, diabetes risk. But we are actually helping people plot their personal route to vitality, which is something the so-called healthcare system doesn't really do. As you say, you, you know, telemedicine, it, it's an extension of medicine, and medicine is a disease care system. The, the difference in, in, with lifestyle as medicine is we actually can envision a health care system where the goal is actually health, whether it's treated disease or even just prevented disease. It's actually help people achieve their greatest potential vitality. And, and you are talking about a platform that takes the best of lifestyle medicine, the best of artificial intelligence, machine learning, the best of telemedicine, and leads in that direction. And that is nothing less than transformational. And so, as you know, I get pretty excited <laughs> while we were having that conversation. Yeah, I wish you recorded it for the podcast, but we didn't <laughs> Well, this was a close approximation. I'm getting pretty yeah, excited again. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a great opportunity. It's, it's it really pretty is. close. And uh, I was working with our uh, team today, you know, trying to explain this to them. And we're, we're getting pretty close to exactly what the vision is. But then ultimately, I think it's about like, you know, selling it to self insured employers and health plans and health systems and either, you know, reducing costs or improving quality, um, which you would think is would be quite possible. Um, because in this addresses all of the major chronic diseases we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, right? It's uh, right. I mean, it's obesity, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, mental health issues. Um, I mean, you could have a smoking cessation program if you wanted to as well, I suppose. And I think about it as more as like uh, telemedicine programs rather than these like, I guess, this episodic care. Yeah. Um, well, you know, again, I, I think there can be episodic interactions with the clinicians and then apps, you know, and, and avatars and a digital delivery in between so that you lighten the burden on the people involved, because that, that's obviously going to be the cost center, right? Paying for, for person mm -hmm. time. Delivering electrons to people is very low cost. That's if you combine the two, you maximize the good. So you get, a, you get the human touch when you need it. You get human judgment when it's most critical, but a lot of this is amplified. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, you raise a critical point. Talk a lot about but evidence reality is that much of what we have is reimbursement based medicine. You know, we do what gets paid for and what gets paid for, you know, is determined by bean counters, not, you know, people who, who, you know, have real vision. Um, so the vision is always out ahead of the reimbursement. And then you're kind of reaching back to try and drag them up where you are and say, you need to pay for what makes the most sense. 
and, and it can be done. Uh, you mentioned Dean Ornish at the beginning. You know, Dean spent the better part of 20 years arguing, using evidence as his argument, with CMMS to get them to reimburse for his heart disease reversal program, which ultimately they, they did. And we all owe him a debt of gratitude because, you know, essentially he tore down the wall. You know, the wall between lifestyle as medicine and reimbursement, we needed somebody to go first. And, you know, Dean was banging on that wall for 20 years and, and finally prevailed. And so now there's additional opportunity. It didn't take really as long for MMS to we're interested in reimbursing for the diabetes prevention program. And, and we're interested in doing that in a variety of ways, including digital delivery and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now with the COVID pandemic and so much of medical practice having migrated to telemedicine, yeah, maybe things will go back partly to the way they were before, but I bet they don't go back completely. And so, you know, I think there's going to be a strong gravitational tug from all of the activity in the telemedicine space for all of the third party payers to step up and say, we have undergone a, a, a transformational moment where a lot of what used to happen face to face had to happen virtually because of the pandemic and is going to continue to happen virtually because everybody's built the systems and gotten used to it. So, you know, we have to basically redirect reimbursement. So, yeah, you know, sometimes the cart leads, sometimes the horse leads. It's an awkward process. It would be nice if, if vision and, and evidence and rationality drove reimbursement. Um, reimbursement tends to be dragged along kicking and screaming, but eventually it does catch up with what the people want, what the people need, what makes sense. And then, you know, on the fly, as we come up with innovations and, and we argue for them, we study them. And, and some of that research, of course, is cost effectiveness research. And ultimately, if we can show not only does this produce better outcomes, but it's lower cost than people needing to, you know, to have face to face appointments all the time, then it's a slam dunk. And, and you know, then I think we, we basically have a, um, an irreversible trend in how true health care gets delivered. And again, for me, the reimbursement's a big part of this because it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's something that can accelerate or decelerate the process. But ultimately, the true value proposition here is the means of going from just reactive disease care to proactive health care, because yeah. this, can, this can do both. Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, the way that I think about building healthcare products, I mean, I'm not a physician. I have kind of a public health background. But I think about, like, what would I want for myself? What would I want for my dad? What would I want the consumer experience to be? And I know um, like Randy Parker, who started MD Live, that's what he thought about. He didn't have healthcare background. He built a huge telemedicine company. Um, but anyway, I know that um, Seth has uh, done his homework here and read your most recent book, which I still have to do. So I want to let him get a few questions in. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, no, and I think all of this is fascinating. Um, and it's just, it's so surprising. Like it's so... It's so surprising to hear how many people are dying early because of things that are completely preventable. Um, and you know, like we don't wanna change. I even find like little resistances in my own life to like, well, I don't really wanna change my diet because it might inconvenience people around you. It's like, eh, I'd rather die 10 years earlier because I don't wanna inconvenience the people around me and stuff. So I, I'm guessing like you run into just a lot of, for lack of a better term, just stupid reasons that people are not willing to change their diet stupid reasons but you know also to be honest Seth um, brute biology um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I, I, so I I've written a lot about the COVID pandemic and uh, one of the pieces that I wrote was health in the time of COVID and, and another was why two pandemics are better than one and both of those channel my amateur knowledge in evolutionary biology I've read extensively on the topic and the human perception of time and threat is endowed to us by you know, a long sweep of struggling to survive on the savanna where the things that were dangerous came at us fast. Red mm -hmm. in tooth and claws are you know, acute danger. So everything about the human nervous system is hardwired to perceive threats in a span of seconds, minutes, maybe hours and days is really pushing it. You translate that to years and decades, which is how chronic disease works, we are just blind to it. Hmm. You know, so I know whether or not I like what I eat today, 
and I can believe you when you tell me it's going to alter my risk for heart disease or diabetes over years, right. but years, I mean, you know, does that activate the fight or flight response? Hell no. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of my writing of late has been, there is a silver lining in the COVID crisis. And that is it's taking all of the liabilities that were here before diabetes, prediabetes, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, et cetera, and making them an acute worry. Hmm. Because those are the risk factors, along with age, for bad mm -hmm. COVID outcomes. Right. And those are hyperendemic in the United States. So whereas you might be blase about diabetes or heart disease, you know, I love the increased risk because I eat badly and don't exercise, but I could always fix it tomorrow and right. tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow never comes. But if you're worried about getting COVID and dying and you're worried about it happening next week, that's the adrenal gland. That's fight or flight. That's, oh, dear God, help me. And there are a lot of those people now and we have their attention. And, you know, it, it's another of the things Lawrence and I have been talking about. They're, they're really, you know, his work on COVID MD, a telemedicine platform to provide digitally delivered healthcare during the pandemic and diabetes prevention. Do they go together? Yeah, because actually diabetes and prediabetes are major leading risk factors for adverse outcomes if you get this virus. Yeah. It's all really one thing. But it's partly, you know, the, the inconvenience of making change. It's mm -hmm. partly human nature. But we really are working to overcome the way we perceive threats. And so we can't just talk about threat. The other thing to do in lifestyle medicine is talk about the upside. This is not, you know, eat well because you should eat well because your health will be better. This is healthy people have more fun. And, right. and by the way, some of the world's most wholesome cuisines, like the Mediterranean diet, for example, are also some of the world's most delightful cuisines. You can love, th this is the tagline from my wife's recipe site, loving food that loves you back. You can love food that loves you back. My wife's a brilliant cook. I, I've been a beneficiary of that for years, but everybody can do it. And is there inconvenience in making a change? Yeah, always some. But I would argue it was inconvenient to learn the alphabet. They tortured us in kindergarten and first grade. You probably don't remember, but you know, if you think back hard enough, you'll remember. I mean, there was real acute anxiety involved. Uh, and yet, was it worth it? We've been literate ever since. Um, learning to ride a bike, you skin your knees a few times, but then you can ride a bike the rest of your life. I mean, in school, I know how to do, there's a learning curve. Eating well is like that. It's not a huge curve, probably easier than learning, you know, to read and write. It takes a little while, but, you know, on the far side of climbing that little hill, truly is a better life. You know, diet that you can love, rehabilitated taste buds that actually like wholesome food better, and a tremendous opportunity to add years to your life, life to years, and Forget about the inconvenience of other people. No, flip that around. The opportunity to pay it forward to the people you love. Hey, join me. Let's do this together. Families really ought to do it together. Yeah. I got to ask you a provocative question since you brought it up. I, I've been seeing you prolifically uh, comment on LinkedIn and various uh, national news outlets about the whole COVID situation. So apologies for the uh, question. But I mean, do you think that, um, do you think that we, should I reopen the country? Do you think that, I don't know, there was an overreaction? Because I've seen things about how if we would have shut down earlier, we would have, on the other hand, there's 40 million people that are unemployed. So uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but not I'm so at, curious. Not at all, not at all. It's easy. Yeah, so it's actually, the answer is pretty simple. In my home state of Connecticut, 60% of the total mortality is nursing homes. 60 percent interesting in ohio it's 72 percent uh, my friend mike Royzen from the cleveland clinic shared that statistic with me and nationally it's over 50 percent if all we had done if all we had done was meticulously protect the frail elderly chronically debilitated people in nursing homes we would have slashed the total mortality in half and i'm not saying that's all we should have done what i'm saying we should have done is identify the risk tiers meticulously protected the most at risk carefully protected those next most at risk and so on and identify that many of us were at extremely low risk you know the risks are you know for example all the kids that we we brought home from school all the, the university students we sent home you know the risk is probably less than the risk of getting hurt while walking across campus or riding a bike or driving a car 
we don't shut down universities because you know if college students ride their bike or cross a street on a college campus some of them occasionally get hurt therefore we're going to shut down all the nation's universities we don't do that i mean they, their their risk was kind of at that level is that low so um it, it, it's only that much clearer these weeks and months and feels like lifetimes later that there's massive risk differential. And so, yes, we should certainly open the country back up, but we should do it in a way that honors the risk differentials and says it's too soon until, until we have a very reliable indication of the all clear. And that would be, you know, widely distributed, perfectly safe, totally effective vaccine, clear evidence of herd immunity or near zero community transmission we still have to carefully protect nursing homes. We have to protect all the, the nation's grandparents. But you know, everybody in the low risk groups definitely can play. And then we, and the, you know, frankly, the, the more of us who do that sooner, the, the sooner we'll, we'll reach one version of the all clear that will allow everybody back in the world. Because this virus isn't gonna go away anytime soon, we need to then carefully monitor. And we need to be prepared to reinstitute protections in a risk stratified basis. So again, you know, maybe we reach the point where we feel it's safe for everybody to go visit their loved ones in nursing homes. As soon as we see an uptick in viral transmission, which might happen in the fall, we re-implement careful firewalls around nursing homes. And, and by the way, there's a lot of detail to the, the mechanics of how do you do that? And I can answer that. Uh, I've been working with colleagues. We have pages and pages of detailed policy approaches. It makes for a boring podcast, though. Just suffice to say there are ways to do it, and people have thought through the details of it. But, you know, essentially what I argued from the beginning, I still feel was right. Total harm minimization, which means the virus can hurt, hurt people, down yeah, people's businesses can hurt them too. And any way you damage health, damage a life, or take one is bad. Any way you prevent that is good. And you can prevent that by protecting people from the virus. You can prevent that by not shutting down people's livelihoods when you don't need to. And the right way to get there from here is to risk stratify the population, meticulously protect those at high risk, do less to protect those who weren't at much risk in the first place. And one more really important thing, Lawrence, and this is the business we're in together. Mm -hmm. When you can change people's risk to the lower, do it. And that's what diabetes prevention does. That's what lifestyle as medicine does. A lot of these risk factors are modifiable. You know, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, prediabetes, diabetes, that's all fixable with lifestyle. And it's not just whether you have or don't have these conditions. If you have them, but they're managed well, your risk goes down dramatically. There are papers that have been published already out of China, other countries, presence of diabetes it's how well controlled it is you improve your diet you improve your lifestyle your glycohemoglobin comes down your diabetes is better controlled your risk of of a bad covid outcome hospitalization death can drop by a factor of four that's huge mm -hmm. so again tremendous opportunity to better manage this pandemic both with policy and with health promotion well thanks for the uh, most interesting podcast we've had to date on this show yeah uh, we're going we're gonna to let you go now, but uh, very exciting podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and I encourage anybody that's listening, um, I actually have it right here. Go get Dr. Kat's recent book, How to Eat. Um, it's available uh, pretty much thank, everywhere. Thank so. you. Uh, th well, thank you very much. And just shout out to my co-author, Mark Bittman. Uh, and everywhere I go, uh, there's a copy of Mark's iconic How to Cook Everything. So we, we call the book How to Eat. We were tempted to say, but not quite everything, <laughs> uh, but we, we let that go. It's, it, it's great. But, and it's you know, fun. It's much. fun. Uh, it's a fun book to read with how you guys structured it. It's like, it's, it feels like you're just sitting down with, um, with you and Dr. Mark or you and Mark Bittman the whole time. And so it, it's really we're great. Just, so, we're just chatting. Good. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. That, that was our intent. Appreciate that. Great. Thanks well, so much. Thank well, you gentlemen, so much for being here. Yeah. Great to be with you. Thanks so much. And, and Lawrence, obviously I, I look forward to the good work that we're going to do together. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Hey everyone. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. David Katz. As I mentioned at the end, go and get his book, how to eat. Uh, it'll challenge you, it'll give you insight, and it's a super conversational read, really fun book to read. You can find the link to it in the show description. So go ahead and go there. Also, we talked a lot today about lifestyle prevention. We have a whole episode on how we should be preventing chronic diseases rather than treating them. It's episode 32. I will also link that 
below in the show description. So if you're looking for another episode to listen to, go ahead and listen to that where we talk more about preventing chronic disease. We'll see you next time on Digital Health Entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm.